So <clears throat> welcome to our uh, department seminar uh, at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And uh, my name is William Fong from the Department of English. And today we are uh, very happy to have Professor Steve Walsh from uh, the, universe, uh, the Newcastle University. Uh, we actually scheduled his talk uh, last year, but uh, uh, we <laughs> finally we are able to host his talk uh, now. So Steve is a professor of applied linguistics and communication in the School of Education, Communication and Language Science at Newcastle, Newcastle University, UK. Uh, he is, uh, you probably know him, he's, he's a world-renowned scholar uh, in the areas of uh, classroom discourse, teacher development, second language teacher education, and professional communication. And he has published uh, uh, 10 books and more than 100 research papers in uh, leading international journals. Okay. And uh, his uh, uh, recent two recent books, also very uh, uh, influential kind of textbook uh, or, or required readings for uh, postgraduate uh, research students of a reflective practice for English language teaching, research-based principles on practice, and also the Rotledge Handbook of English Language Teacher Education. So today, uh, Steve is going to share with us uh, his uh, talk about analyzing university spoken interaction, a CLCA approach. Okay, so over to you, Steve. Thanks, William, and um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. I start my these days because I'm uh, I'm often in different time zones, so uh, you have to change your greetings now according to where you are, right? Uh, so thanks very much to you guys for coming and for William, Hans and the team uh, at your university for inviting me. As, um, as William said, this should have been live some time ago, but obviously things have changed everything and uh, we're forced to work like this. So I'm going to share with you some work that's been going on with me uh, for some years and which I'm actually trying to encourage more people to try. Um, I remember when I first started teaching a long time ago, there was a saying uh, which was going around, and I think it's still going around, don't be a slave to the course book. Don't be a slave to the course book. In other words, make the material work for you rather than you working for the material. And there's some element of truth here in um, research and research methods, I think, in terms of a lot of the time, we are using tried and tested uh, methods which have been around a long time without challenging them and without actually trying alternative approaches, new approaches, things which perhaps shouldn't work together, but which might work together. And I would encourage all of you, uh, new researchers and well-established researchers to challenge your methodology and think about alternatives all the time. And that's what this talk is about, really. It's about combining uh, corpus linguistics with conversation analysis, which rightly, according to the literature on epistemology and ontology and things like this, they should not be combinable. They should not be allowed to be at the same table because they come from extremely different backgrounds. They come, you know, from different ontologies, different ways of looking at the world. But one thing about research in our field is that we do need to find new ways of actually looking at our world. And when we find new ways of looking at it, we obviously see different things and uh, new ideas emerge and new um, ways of looking at, new ways of doing research emerge. So the first part of the talk is going to be about that. And then towards the sort of last third, I want to talk about more recent work, which is looking at um, discourses. In other words, the discourses of different subject areas and how a combined approach like this one might be useful and helpful in, uh, in understanding those different discourses. So let's just begin. Um, the starting point for this work is really just to say that uh, we, the work I've done, the recent, the, the, sorry, the older work I've done, the, the, the more distant work, was with the University of Limerick in Ireland with my good friend Anne O'Keefe and Tom Morton, 
Um, and we were looking very much at universities across two different contexts. So the University of Limerick and Queen's University Belfast was where we, we did the early part of this work. And at the time, we were very interested in small group teaching. Now, one person's small group can be another person's lecture, as we all know. Uh, I know that medics often lecture people with three or 400 people in a group. Um, so a small group for a, a person working in medicine might be 40 students. Uh, for me, 40 students might be a lecture because we tend to work with smaller groups. But anyway, the point is that the reason we chose small groups rather than lectures is because we were interested in the interactions which took place between uh, the, the teachers and the, um, and the students. The issue really in many contexts is that uh, seminars and tutorials and small group teaching more generally are supposed to be different from a lecture, but very often they, they're not. They're just an extension of a lecture. So the interactions which should take place actually don't take place. And one of the things we wanted to look at here was uh, to what extent is that true? So previous work uh, that's been uh, carried out in this area tends to focus very much on um, things like tasks. So Benwell and Stoko are two conversation analysts. Identity, their work, Discourse and Identity. If you don't know this book, 2006 is a really, really good introduction to the ways in which identities are negotiated. Um, Liz Stoko's work on topicality, my colleague Paul Seedhouse here at Newcastle looks at on task and off task talk in small group discussions. So there is, there is some work here, but most of it has, in fact, all of the work I'm showing you here has used conversation analysis, not with corpus linguistics. So our question was really a methodological question. It was, what can we gain by using a combination of linguistics and an applied conversation analytic approach. Now, applied conversation analysis is somewhat different from a, a more pure form of CA. Applied conversation analysis usually looks at something as a problem, as an issue, rather than letting the data do the talking, we begin with something that we're interested in. So in this case, we were interested in the interactions which took place in small group teaching. It's a slightly different approach to the normal, more traditional views of uh, conversation analysis. You know, this idea, this idea that, um, that, for example, we can look at something in an unmotivated way. And, you know, this is something I fundamentally disagree with. I have a love-hate relationship with CA, as some of you will know. And one of the things I disagree with fundamentally is that you can't approach data without motivation. You, you always have a reason for looking at your data. So anyway, that's a, a bit of the sort of background to the, to the work we did. Um, the corpus we used was called libel case, libel case which has other meanings in, in the field of law. Um, the Limerick and Belfast Corpus of Academic sorry, Lim Limerick and Belfast Corpus of Academic English. Um, and it is also comparable to a more recent one, which I built at Newcastle called the Newcastle University Corpus of Academic Spoken English. That was 2014. Um, both of these corpora are quite large. They extend across common disciplinary sites. Um, so for example, uh, humanities, social sciences, business engineering, and so on. And the, the reason for that is that we want to be able to make comparisons from one context to another. We also, in corpus linguistics, usually use a, uh, a reference corpus. And the one we used here was called uh, LC, the Limerick Corpus of Irish English. So our aim was to see how can we combine these two distinct methodologies together, how can we bring them together to enhance our understandings of spoken interaction? And when you look at the limitations of each, 
you see that corpus linguistics tends to be acontextual. It focuses on large scale analysis without really knowing the detail of the context, whereas CA has the opposite issue. It will focus very much on um, small amounts of data in great detail, but it can't generalize to a larger context. So they both have their weaknesses. And what we were trying to do was see whether by bringing them together, could we overcome some of their limitations? The, the rationale is to get an up close, what uh, Leo van Leer refers to as an ecological understanding of educational interaction. And we're claiming, uh, when I say we, I'm talking about my, my colleagues in Limerick, Anne O'Keefe, and Tom Morton and a few other people. Uh, we're claiming that CLCA offers powerful insights into this, this particular thing here. How do words, utterances, and text come together to co-construct meaning? How do they do that? And importantly, how do they combine to assist or hinder learning, um, which is obviously something that we're very interested in. So yeah, I think that's probably enough on the, the background. It is very much a mixed methods uh, approach. Um, and I think it's fair to say that in applied linguistics and social sciences more generally, mixed methods is the predominant methodology that's being used um, for very good reasons. You know, It's very good to have uh, a landscape with large data against which we look at smaller case studies in more detail. I think that's a very principled and, and solid approach to research in general, especially in our field. So let's begin by looking at the corpus linguistics side of things. What we did to begin with was to identify a smaller corpus of 50,000 words, uh, where there were examples of what we would call small group teaching. Now, small group teaching in this 50,000 words was defined simply because there was evidence of some kind of interaction, which in itself is a finding. Remember, we, we started with a million words. We found 50,000 words, which tells us that, that out of a million words, only 50,000 are uh, examples of small group teaching, which in itself is actually a result. You know, it's, it's quite significant, isn't it? In, in the sense it's a small number of people really involved in small group teaching. The, the, the machinery, the instruments we used were um, word and cluster frequency, and we looked at concordance as well. And I have to say that my colleagues in uh, Limerick are more experienced than me at this, but this is, what we, this is what we did. We found the single word frequencies in the 50,000 words, and we compared them with our reference corpus of a million words. So what we're doing here is we're looking for the highs and the lows, the, the frequencies are, are, which are significantly higher or significantly lower in our focus corpus, which is the 50,000 words, versus the same words in a larger corpus, our reference corpus. And this is what we found. We found these were our sort of top 10, if you like, of words which were occurring in the in the educational corpus. And not surprisingly, these were our most frequently occurring words. So a lot of discourse markers like so and okay, question words. Um, these words, these small words are actually very important in educational discourse because they often mark transitions between one part of a lesson or one part of a lecture and another. So for example, quite a few of my Master students have looked at the word okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry, somebody's in the waiting room. Sorry. <laughs> well, we got that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, words like okay do a huge amount of interactional work in classroom discourse. And it's not always the same work. Okay can be used to grab attention, to mark a transition, to give feedback it's doing different kinds of work. So discourse markers are an important group. Um, from single words, we moved to 
clusters. These are words between two and six words. And we found 128 items, in other words, clusters, which were more frequently used in the small group corpus than the, large group, the, the larger corpus. So they have significance. And we organize these by language function into these six different functional categories. Elicitation, feedback, task management, demonstrating and sequencing, time reference, and discourse markers of shared space. The last category here, this um, discourse markers of shared space, is a very important one because one of the things we found in, in not just this work, but lots of work that I've been involved in, is that it is absolutely crucial to create shared space in classroom interaction where learning can take place. So I did a paper uh, 2013 with Dr. Lee Lee, for example, at the University of Exeter called Conversations as Space for Learning. And we were looking at the, 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 the importance of uh, teachers creating this shared space through the language that they used. I'm not going to go through these, don't worry, but it's just um, these are just examples of these clusters and um, a couple of interesting things here. Note the number of questions, question words like do and anybody got any idea and how. So, you know, this is all about getting feedback, getting ideas. But notice, I don't know if you can see this, the towards the end here, this ye, because in Irish English, they have a, a plural word for you, which is ye. So have ye any point on that? Is you plural? <laughs> and that's quite a, a kind of interesting. You wouldn't get that in most UK corpora. So there's just some examples. And then we get the feedback. So this is when you've asked a question, you've got a response and you give feedback. Notice the kind of discourse being used here. Like again, heavy use of okay, lots of words like good and very good and yeah, yeah, yeah. This kind of feedback on, on responses. Now, again, just by way of interest, what I've found in my work is that although it is extremely important to, to value contributions made by students, words like very good and thank you and yeah, tend to close down the interaction rather than open it up. So if you want to create space, then you need to find a different way of giving feedback. And so, for example, something like, uh, okay, so, could you tell us more about that? That's a really interesting answer. It's going to create longer, fuller, more elaborated responses, which is what we need, especially in seminar talk, where we're trying to explore things in more detail. So instead of closing it down by saying, great, thank you, we need to try and open up this space by finding different ways of giving feedback. Okay, so third, third set here, things, um, managing learning, managing tasks and activities. So again, note the use of you and ye. Do you think you could? I mean, I'll give you my most frequently one personally when I'm working with a group of students. I say, okay, right now. So what I'd like you to do next is, which is a very long winded way of saying, do this or do that. And we all have these idiosyncrasies in our talk. And some of them are actually quite beneficial to teaching and learning, and some of them aren't. So it's a good idea to be very aware of your classroom idiolect. Idiolect is your individual way of talking. Which parts of your idiolect can you transfer to a teaching situation, and which parts should not be taken into the classroom? So kind of interesting there. Um, demonstrating and sequencing, again, all management of learning, um, time references. A lot of what we do when we're teaching is we are locating our teaching and our learning in time and place. So things like, so you remember last week we were doing blah, 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 blah. And next week we're going to, uh, these time references are quite important in, in the work we do. And then these this fantastic category of, um, discourse markers of shared space. Um, note the use of you know and you see, which I'll talk about in a minute. They are used a lot. Um, and I'll say more about that. But those of you who are looking for research projects right now, 
or looking for ideas for a project and you're interested in classroom interaction and classroom discourse, have a look at this category because believe me, it is absolutely fascinating and extremely important to the influence it has on teaching and learning. So from our corpus linguistics approach, we've identified six categories, uh, functional categories, discourse functions, and 128 items. So what we've done is we've scoped out the data and we've got something to look at now in more detail. Now, we could have looked at all this data using CA alone, but we wouldn't really know what the highs and lows were. We wouldn't know the points of significance and we would have less interesting things to say. So this is where we're going closer now using um, uh, conversation analysis. Now, if you look at the work of Keith Richards, 2005, uh, he, he says that CA is performing, or rather applied CA is performing an enabling role. In other words, it's providing insights for professional practice. And this is what I was saying earlier on, when we talk about applied CA, it is very often in relation to a profession, a discipline, or a particular problem or issue. Um, what we were interested in here was that were the, these um, interactional features such as turn design, sequence, uh, lexical choice, these more dynamic features, which are more difficult to quantify, but equally important. So what we identified were these, uh, these different um, functional categories, each with different pedagogic and interactional features. But the words in bold here are the thing you need to focus on. Certain words and lexical chunks were unevenly distributed through the corpus. In other words, they had what we call keyness. Keyness means certain words are more frequent, but they're also doing a lot more work um, in the corpus. And by using CA, we were able to look at these sequences more closely and find out what's going on here. So the work of Shegloff, a very famous conversation analyst, he talks about what we call interactional projects, which are um, basically sequences of sequences. So instead of looking at turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four, turn by turn, we do that, but we're interested in how those turns build up into um, an exchange system. So you get maybe six or eight or 10 turns all together, creating what you might call a micro context. And this chimes very strongly with my work on uh, classroom modes and Paul Seedhouse's work on classroom micro contexts. Um, so we're interested in longer stretches of discourse and um, trying to identify specific exchange systems within those uh, longer stretches. So going back to Shegloff's work, um, he's interested in all these classic features of CA, such as turn design and turn taking, but bigger, longer uh, sequences, such as requesting and telling and using adjacency pairs to repair and to clarify all the things that we do when we're teaching. Um, and the goals, as, as Paul Seedhouse rightly points out, the pedagogic goals of the moment strongly influence the shape of the interaction, or to use the term architecture. Interaction has a certain architecture, and in educational discourse, that architecture is influenced very strongly by the goals of the moment. And you can see this in other, other contexts. If you look at doctor-patient interaction, it has a particular shape. If you look at um, more transactional interactions, such as buying something in a shop or ordering a coffee, again, it has a different shape. And if you look at the work of uh, uh, John Heritage and, and Great Batch, they talk about these micro contexts having distinct fingerprints, which is another way of thinking about them. They are quite distinct in their shape. So we identified these four uh, micro contexts, procedural, didactic, argumentational, and empathic. And I just wanna, so each of these is a micro context consisting of a series of turns with a particular shape and a particular pedagogic goal. That's the way to 
to kind of think about each of these micro contexts. So here's an example from um, didactic talk. Um, the words in bold here, you don't have to read this in detail, and I will share the slides with you later so um, you can look at this more closely. Um, you can see the kind of words that are being used here. Can you tell me what, what type of, anyone have any idea? Can anyone, and the last bit here is, you know, oh, this is fun at nine o'clock on a Monday morning, kind of, you know, 20 questions. In other words, the teacher's getting a little bit frustrated here because we're not getting any response. So it's talk related to the topic, the topic or the subject, the discipline. Um, so yeah, tightly controlled turn taking, um, a sort of testing of students' knowledge, lots of display questions, questions that the, the tutor already knows the answer to, um, and this idea of fishing for particular ideas in the context of small group tasks. So tightly controlled, um, short responses from students, longer contributions from tutor, and um, highly linked to the pedagogy of the moment. Compare that with this one. This is really interesting, actually. Um, this is um, a group of students. I'm just having to play around with my screen here, just a sec. I'm just moving something out of the way. This is a group of film study students in uh, the University of Limerick. And we call this empathic talk because there's a lot of co-construction here. Notice that the tutor, T, could equally be one of the students, so S1, S2, S3, because his contributions are actually quite short. Notice too, the use of you see and you know, and I'll, I'll show you that more uh, in a more quantitative way in a minute. But the interesting bit is towards the end where with the tutor says, yeah, okay, you see, that's the thing like, like you know, I mean, like really, now look at that, that is a fascinating piece of discourse. And what's going on here is that the tutor in the early part of the exchange is behaving very much like a friend, a facilitator. Yeah, I know, I understand, I get it. But here, okay, yeah, you see, that's the thing, like, you know, I mean, like, really, he's becoming a tutor again. He's doing some teaching. It all comes down to the director and the people need to respect that immediately, you know. So it, what he's saying is, you've got to be respectful of the director in a, in a film studies context, and it's the director that you have to listen to. And what we see here is a very good example of um, the work on footings, change of footing, where you kind of shift one identity to another. So in the first part, I'm your friend, I'm your equal, but towards the end, I'm becoming your tutor again. And I need to do all this work, all this interactional work to change from friend to teacher again. That's the thing, like, you know, I mean, like, very nice example. And, and look at the use of you see and you know here. Let's talk about that a little bit. So here we have in the orange color, uh, seminar talk, and the green is conversation. Now, Grammatically, I think I'm right in saying this, the difference between you see and you know is that you see is used to introduce something new, whereas you know is used to introduce something that's shared, okay? Now, in a teaching context, wouldn't you normally expect you see to be much higher than you know? In fact, it's the opposite. In our data, the seminar talk, you know, was used more than twice as much as it is in a in conversational talk, whereas you see was almost the same in conversation and seminar. So this was a little bit of a puzzle for us. And we, we did a bit, a bit more work on this and we came to the conclusion that you know is used to create this idea of shared space. When you say you see, you're lecturing, you're teaching. But when you say, you know, you're being empathic, empathetic rather, you're, you're sharing space. And that's so important for teaching and learning. So it's quite an interesting observation from our data. Um, so in empathic talk, we get um, 
lots of discourse markers, agreements to assessment rather than disagreement, um, an increase in preferred rather than dispreferred responses in adjacency pairs, uh, lots of supportive um, work like yeah and you know and you see, more even distribution of turns, and um, students actually playing a bigger role in managing the floor and directing the interaction in a way which resembles everyday conversation. So these two together, what can we say? Well, they both use um, a corpus. Um, they both refer to baseline comparisons with other types of interactions. Conversation analysis offers a more emic close-up perspective, whereas corpus linguistics is um, saying something about the bigger picture. And by the way, um, I should just highlight some work that's going on in the uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles right now, a guy called uh, Tao, T-A-O. He's starting to do frequency counts in conversation analysis. So there are certain things which you can actually count. You can count openings and closings of terms. You can count silences, pauses. You can count transitions. You can count discourse markers. So I think one of the challenges for conversation analysis in the future is that it, it will probably need to become more quantitative and less qualitative and use some of the technology which is available now um, to, to highlight the, the, the features which can be counted. And therefore, we can generalize to bigger contexts and say more significant things, which we can't do right now. Um, so there are quite a lot of similarities between the two, as highlighted in this slide. Um, but there are also some differences. And we've tried to put this together in a sort of diagram. I'm not sure if this actually works. But what we're claiming is that corpus linguistics starts from the word through patterns and clusters to turn, whereas conversation analysis starts with the turn and works towards context or micro context, or as Shegloff calls it, sequence of sequences, an exchange structure, if you like. And it starts with sequence and things like topic management. And by the way, another research idea, if you're, if you're looking for some, topic is under-researched in pretty well everything we do. We need more research on topic. Very important in understanding coherence in spoken discourse. So if you're looking for a new idea for research, have a look at topic. Lots of work needed there. So that's our attempt to sort of say, how do they complement each other? Um, corpus linguistics begins with word and works up to turn, whereas conversation analysis starts with the turn and works up to micro context or exchange system. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about some more recent work and uh, show you some examples of, of some studies which have looked at how corpus linguistics with conversation analysis can help us understand interdisciplinary discourse. And I'd like to highlight the work here of um, Sung Suk Choi and Keith Richards, who've just written a book, 2019, called interdisciplinary discourse. And, and some of their ideas um, are very much um, chiming with the things I'm saying here about corpus linguistics with conversation analysis. And in their book, they actually, um, they actually use corpus linguistics with conversation analysis. So what we're interested in here is how, so this is the reference to Choi and Richards, how does interdisciplinary research, this is not teaching now, this is looking at teams of researchers in interdisciplinary research meetings. It's looking at their interactions. So you've got mathematicians working with architects and engineers um, and so on, working across disciplines, which is very much the, um, the focus of current research approaches. And applied linguistics has a huge role to play here in helping people understand the language of their discipline, the ways in which we use language perhaps differently 
when we come from um, different backgrounds. So here's the problem. As researchers, we have different views on the world. We have different epistemological and ontological assumptions, which means that our methods differ quite, quite a lot. We don't often, I would say, we don't often, never mind always, speak the same language. And we often use the same language to mean different things. So there are huge issues here in communicating um, the discipline of, of, say, discipline A with the discipline of discipline B and coming to some kind of shared understanding so that we can come together. The other problem, the last bullet point on this slide, everyone has a very strong disciplinary allegiance. You know, we, we are very loyal to our discipline and uh, we want to protect it in as, in as many ways as we can, which means we're less open to looking at it in a different way. And this is the kind of work which the, this 2019 work, uh, Choi and Richards, this is what they did. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to give you some examples of things I've been involved in, which have used the same kind of approach where different disciplines have come together. The biggest one I was involved in was some years ago now in, uh, in Northern Ireland. It was a one over a million pound project uh, looking at interprofessional research, education research with doctors, dentists, nurses, and pharmacists. And you're going to say, yeah, but that's all the same field, right? It's medicine. Trust me, they do not speak the same language at all. They have very different understandings of common problems. So we use both quant and qual data. Um, we were interested in the interactions between these groups. And one of the main findings, which again coincides with what I'm saying in this talk, the importance of interaction, the importance of collaboration, the importance of making your subject knowledge explicit. The first question that people ask me when, when I say I'm an applied linguist, applied linguist is how many languages do you speak? And I'm sure many of you here have had the same experience. Now, it's our challenge then to make clear what applied linguistics is about. It's not the study of language per se, it's much more about the use of language and how we communicate through language and interaction. And this is something which um, we all need to think about actually. Um, so this was one project where we use corpus linguistics for conversation analysis. More recently, this is my new case corpus at Newcastle University. Um, we were interested in interactional competence, which is something I've been working at, on for many years now. It was a one million, sorry, it still is a one million word corpus of uh, academic spoken English uh, across three different uh, faculties. And what we found was that interactional competence varies hugely according to discipline. So the interactional competence of, say, a maths tutor is very different from that of a history tutor or a tutor in engineering. So we have these interactional competencies working across different subject areas, which has huge implications for teaching and learning in small groups and huge implications for helping professional development in different discipline areas. And I'm thinking here again of the work of James Paul Gee or G, I never know this guy, how you pronounce his surname, who talks about this in, in, in his own work, the ways in which there are discourses, plural, of different disciplines. Uh, more recently, I did some work with a group of dentists in Italy, and we had uh, applied linguists working with people from dentistry, law, and education. And we were interested here in transprofessional education, not interprofessional, but across the disciplines, across different subject areas, how do professionals work together? And there's a, ref, um, uh, a link there to a publication uh, which, we, which came out of that work. Um, it's absolutely clear to me that there is massive potential for both education and applied linguistics to link and work with other disciplines. We have a lot to offer uh, from our own subject base. Um, and this is a project which hasn't even begun yet. It's something we've been talking about here at Newcastle for some time now, looking at judicial review, which is how do um, legal cases, historically, how do they change the language 
of big cases, and they're all available in the public domain because they have to be published. So they're there, but how has the use of language changed? And how has that changed the process of this very important part of the law? Um, and in this project, we're going to try corpus linguistics with critical discourse analysis, which those two have been used quite a lot together. Um, and we're interested because it's written discourse and because things like power and identity are very important in, in the legal profession, uh, we're going to try that kind of methodology. And then finally, and uh, there's the reference to James Porgy, um, looking at English medium instruction and content and language integrated learning. Um, a new project just starting with my good friend, Tom Morton and old Jay Sert in, uh, he's in Sweden and Tom is in Spain. We're going to be looking at the ways in which school subjects are talked into being. These are subjects in um, Sweden, the UK and Spain, which are taught through a different language. So very much like what you do in Hong Kong, you have English medium schools, and there's quite a lot of work being done on that by my colleagues um, at Hong Kong U. Uh, we have content and language integrated learning as well. Um, how does the talk differ from one subject area to another? And again, we need to sort of understand that so that we can enhance learning and create better learning opportunities. So just to finish with a few predictions of, of where, you know, the big so what about all this work? Well, I think it's absolutely apparent, given the COVID situation we're in now, that there will be new disciplines emerging, which will be a combination of merging old ones, but also the creation of completely new ones. I'm, you know, I'm looking at, for example, um, what do they call it? Genetic engineering, for example. Um, the people work at the, the epidemiolo epidemiologists and virologists and doctors and other, other disciplines working right now on vaccines for COVID. You know, so that's going to open up whole new disciplines uh, in the future, which again creates opportunities for us as applied linguists. I think also creation of new methodologies, which will allow old issues to be studied in a different way. And I'm going to flag up the work of my uh, research student, Yana Lee here, who's looking now at the role of um, interaction in reflective practice. So the conversations that take place between, um, sorry, I'm getting a message here, that's why I'm hesitating. The interactions which take place between professionals when they're reflecting on and talking about their practice. And Yana is using, again, a combination of corpus linguistics and conversation analysis. Uh, we need greater collaboration. We need to make our research more accessible. I think a big part of this is about how we educate other people in the work that we do. And I've already made the case for using big data with smaller case studies. I think this is a, a very valid way forward. Um, I think there will be you know, new understandings of what we mean by evidence. So one, one thing here, which is becoming more and more apparent is the importance of video in our work. Video is the future. We can make videos so easily now. So that has lots of implications. Even the way we're working at the moment, we're working on screen that has lots of um, interest, doesn't it? In terms of how does that affect teaching and learning? Um, we're just publishing a paper in the RELC journal, which will come out next year on what we're calling ECIC, classroom interactional content, uh, classroom interactional competence in an online setting. What does it look like? And that paper will be out probably early next year. Um, I've already mentioned the, the C19 issue. Uh, Hong Kong U are creating a space for the promotion of interdisciplinary research. Um, and I think, you know, for all of us involved in research right now, the, the impact agenda is becoming more and more important. You know, the big so what uh, of our work, how does it make a difference to the ordinary people in society? How does it enhance their lives? Um, yeah, impact is going to play a big role in promoting us to work across disciplines 
And that's going to create challenges for things like PhD supervision. We're going to need supervisors from different academic backgrounds, different disciplines, and there will certainly be supervisory issues when we get disciplines coming together like that. Interesting ones, but also challenging ones um, when that happens. Yeah, I think we can say that there will be um, more greater needs for understanding the whole process of interaction, communication, integration, what you might call these 21st century skills, which are being flagged up in the workplace, skills around communication, collaboration, teamwork, the use of technology, and so on. And perhaps education itself should be expanded a lot more to include professional development and transprofessional learning, not just um, teaching and teacher training and things like that. I think we need to go beyond that now. Yeah, so in, in this particular study, I think we can say that CLCA offers us um, detailed descriptions of interaction from linguistic, interactional, and pedagogic perspectives. So from a linguistic point of view, we can look at the uh, high frequency words, keywords, multi-word units, discourse markers, and so on. We can look at that, we can study that and say what's going on. We can look at the turn taking, turn management, sequence, and so on. And we can say, how do these two give us greater insights into pedagogy? What's going on in terms of practices in the classroom, such as explanations, instructions, elicitations, and so on. Um, here in this, in the work I've shown you today, the focus was very much on sort of practice. You know, what are we doing? Are we trying to elicit? Are we giving feedback? Are we repairing? Are we, are we building sequences? In the future, we could look at the, these four different micro contexts and look at how they combine and how they cohere. Uh, work I did with several research students, all got PhDs from New Case, uh, looking very much at discipline specific knowledge and learning. And I'm thinking here of Basil Bernstein's work, 1998. He talks about vertical and horizontal knowledge, which I haven't got time to talk about right now, but have a look at it. Um, and this is the kind of final slide with a, with a link to the paper uh, where we talk about CLCA um, in spoken discourse in, in, in university interactions. And I would encourage you, just have a go, you know, have a go with this um, approach, try it out. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. I think there's a little bit of time